Hi, my name is Brian Computer. I recently graduated from Strongsville High School and I'm a rising freshman at New York University for the fall. Uh, my study for the summer was performance of PCA3 in comparison to PSA as a screening test for prostate cancer incidence and grade in initial prostate biopsies. Uh, so here's a little background. Um, you can see that uh, the pr prostate cancer is the most common new cancer that's found in adult males today. It's about 30% of new cancers uh, for males, and it's also the second highest cause of death, uh, cancer-related deaths in males. And uh, on the illustration, you can see just where the prostate is, and you can see the, the both lobes, the base, and the apex. So you can see now that uh, the, rate of, the rate of prostate cancer is only growing now, and uh, the, the main reason for that is they're doing more prostate biopsies, so with those more prostate biopsies, you're going to find more cancer, obviously. Um, the interesting thing here, though, is that the death rate is actually going down, and that's because the treatments for prostate cancer are only getting better. So in screening, uh, m the main factors they use will be the digital rectal exam and the prostate-specific antigen. Uh, however, they, do, they are developing nomograms, especially at the Cleveland Clinic here with Dr. Catan. Uh, and a nomogram is they'll give each of these different characteristics certain point values, and then at the end you add up all the point values, and then you can see what the the what risk you are, um, especially in comparison to the average person, of getting prostate cancer. Because if you if you do a, a biopsy of any random person who got hit by a car in their like 50s or something, uh, there's about a a 40 percent chance that you'll find prostate cancer. However, the chance of finding prostate cancer in a prostate biopsy is actually just a little bit better than that. Uh, so it's still an evolving science. So uh, prostate-specific antigen, even though it's used everywhere in the world, there are still some major flaws with it. Um, a lot of times you'll have artificially high results because PSA is dependent on prostate volume, and a lot of times uh, it could just be prostatitis that is increasing that prostate-specific antigen. Uh, which that's something that's in the blood that's secreted by the prostate, and it does have a high correlation between um, a higher PSA and having prostate cancer. Um, there is a gray area, though, which is between 2.5 and 3.99, where uh, the doctor isn't sure when to perform a prostate biopsy and when not to because uh, PSA's predictive value is kind of known to be a little flawed in there and it only has a positive predictive value of about 35%. It does catch pretty much mo most of the cancers that we know of. Um, however, there are a lot of unnecessary biopsies. So an important thing to note here is that if the digital rectal exam is abnormal, i.e. they'll find you know, uh, asymmetry or something in the prostates, uh, that's what's traditionally known. You know, the, the doctor puts his thumb up the, the patient's uh, rectum. Um, then they'll do a prostate biopsy, and if the PSA is elevated to a certain point, they'll do a prostate biopsy. Uh, the prostate biopsy, and as you can see there, there are over a million prostate biopsies done annually. Um, so the goal in prostate cancer screening is to, you know, ha have have high specificity and sensitivity. Which specificity is, you know, if you had perfect specificity every prostate biopsy you did would find prostate cancer. Now that itself speaks to nothing as to um, the, the amount of the prostate cancers in the population that you find. It just means that when you do a biopsy, you will, have, you will find prostate cancer. So this would mean having few unnecessary biopsies. And sensitivity is catching all the prostate cancers, which we're kind of right now in an imbalance between sensitivity and specificity in that sensitivity is greater, but specificity is not that great. So we're catching most of the prostate cancers. However, there are a lot of unnecessary biopsies. And with the way things are, that only increases your risk of having infection or other problems as a result of undergoing that prostate biopsy. So our hypothesis was that if PCA3 uh, which is an mRNA secreted by prostate cancer cells specifically, uh, potentially correlates with high, uh, highlight with any prostate cancer, as well as high-grade prostate cancer, which is a Gleason score of greater than or equal to 7, which Gleason score is something that 
the, the doctor, the pathology people will assign to a tumor based on how far it is advancing. Um, and that's known to be, you know, kind of a, a more lethal cancer. The current standard PSA has low specificity. Um, then PCA3 should outperform PSA in terms of specificity and screening for any prostate cancer as well as um, high-grade prostate cancer. So what we did, uh, we did a receiver operating characteristic analysis of PCA3 and PSA. So basically, um, the ROC curves will analyze the specificity and the sensitivity of both tests for the given data set. Um, any missing values we had as far as the, the variables were uh, multiply imputed. Uh, we also did multivariable logistic regression analysis of PCA3 um, so as to see how highly it corresponded with prostate cancer as well as an odd ratio um, calculated for PCA3 just to see if it was you know, what, it, factoring in all of the other things to see if it was still an effective predictor. We also, um, of the, the 2,800 patients we had for the overall study, we had 407 patients with a normal DRE and a PSA between 2.5 and 3.99. So that's that gray area where uh, scientists are never sure if they should do that prostate biopsy or not. So we wanted to see how PCA3 performed versus PSA in this gray range specifically. So as you can see, there were 2,884 initial prostate biopsy patients. 72% um, were negative, 28% were positive, and you can see the high grade and the low grade distribution as well. Um, here's a summation of some of the characteristics. Um, you can look at age, BMI, prostate volume, PCA3, PSA. Um, you can see their means, their standard deviation, how many were missing. And like I said, the missing values were multiply imputed. Um, then you can also see family history, DRE, um, and then also the incidence of prostate cancer and high-grade prostate cancer. So this is the first ROC analysis. This is uh, specifically PS PCA3 versus PSA for any prostate cancer among the 2884 patients. And you can see that the area of the curve is pretty much 0.1 greater for PCA3, which means it captures more. And you can see uh, at any point with the PSA cutoff value, um, you could administer a PCA3 cutoff value and either maximize more sensitivity or maximize more specificity. So you, there's pretty much a complete domination in this graph here. And this is for high-grade prostate cancer. You can see PSA. Um, got better, as did PCA3. However, PCA3 is still uh, 0.05 greater in the area under the curve, which is, again, significant. As you can see, no, uh, PCA3 is catching more specificity and sensitivity in that graph. Um, this is the probability of having prostate cancer, assuming the other characteristics are at the mean, which means um, you know, this is a multivariable regression in which you assume that all of the other variables are at their mean so that they're not putting, they're, they're not influencing the rate of cancer, um, which a lot of those things do. So that's why you see the probability is only around, you know, 0.4% as the, even as the PCA3 goes um, extremely high. And the, the dotted lines you can see around the graph, that's a 95% confidence interval. So around th those lines, you should capture 95% of the data. This is the probability of high-grade cancer, assuming the other characteristics at, at, at the mean. And you can see just kind of a, the, the main thing to know here is there's just less of a uh, probability, as, which would make sense because high-grade cancer is more rare. So uh, this is uh, just showing you the area under the curve model for, and, as well as the p-value for PCA3, just to see with all the other variables, did it matter? And you can see that in both, the p-value was significant um, with any cancer having a 0.36% chance that it was due to chance. Um, so that's really significant and shows a lot that PCA3 is correlating highly. Uh, here's some odd ratio table for uh, prostate cancer. You can see all of our uh, variables were statistically significant except body mass index and uh, a possible reason for that is because we had to uh, impute a lot of those values. 
but you can see PCA3 was definitely significant for prostate cancer. And as well as high-grade prostate cancer, you can see that everything was significant, even bo body mass index for this one, and PCA3, again, is as well. So this is uh, that, that gray range uh, where the DRA was uh, normal and PSA was 2.5 to 3.99. You can see that PSA more or less follows that, that line, which means that it has very little predictive accuracy, whereas PCA3 still maintains um, uh, a figure that's more curvy, which means it's capturing more and, and, and does uh, maintain predictive accuracy, whereas PSA did not. And you can see the same thing happened with uh, high-grade prostate cancer. So that's really significant. Um, so you can see that the PCA3 values, um, what, what, with that, we can see that they correlated to prostate cancer, high-grade prostate cancer, and that it discriminates against prostate cancers and high-grade prostate cancers. PCA3, when compared um, directly with PSA, dominated it in all of the ROC analyses. Um, Prostate-specific antigen failed to maintain that predictive integrity in the gray range. However, PS PCA3 um, still had a similar area on the curve. So PC we say PCA3 did way better overall. The, the, the problem with it is, even though in a perfect world you would say, well, PCA3 should, um, <coughs> PCA3 should replace PSA because PCA3 dominated it. However, PSA... Um, you know, if you think about it in a rational manner, PSA is still used worldwide, and you're never really going to get rid of it. And it will still continue to dictate clinical co decisions when it's elevated. So our department came up with the idea to utilize PCA3 as a tool um, when dealing with patients in the gray range. So when you're not sure whether to do a prostate biopsy or not, that's when patients should be getting a PCA3 score to see um, if they should be getting that biopsy or if it might be unnecessary. And uh, nomograms are the pride of QHS here at the clinic. Um, so if you integrate PCA3 into it, um, you're only going to improve that predictive accuracy. And then continue studies, um, revalidate it, especially um, our, our patient population was very homogenous in that it was mostly white, so we didn't even consider that as, as a, uh, a variable earlier. Um, also, we couldn't have, we didn't have enough data for a repro repeat biopsies. We only had about uh, 300 of those. And like I said, there were lots of missing data. Um, we couldn't even include free PSA into our, a lot of our analyses. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. J. Stephen Jones, Chong Ong Yu, uh, Dr. Ahmed El Shafay, Dr. Michael Katan, uh, Patty Miners, Tracy Krebs, uh, the whole Glickman Urological Institute, uh, quantitative Health Services, as well as the Cleveland Clinic Office of Civic Education Initiatives, especially Nedra Starling and Rosalind Strickland for the opportunity they've given me.